Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 6, Genetic Change. This is video number 13 and the last in our second inquiry question uh, section on biotechnology. This time we're going to be focusing on biotechnology and biodiversity. So what we need to do is this is another part of our investigating the uses of applications of biotechnology past, present and future. But the key word here is evaluating. So what we want you to be able to do is place a value on all of these changes that we're making as a result of genetic technologies on the Earth's biodiversity. If you're going to do that, you need to know what biodiversity is and how our use of biotechnology has been associated with um, uh, or has impacted on um, biodiversity and society, I guess, in general. But what we're looking at here in particular is how um, the changes that we're able to make now in a number of different species of both plants and animals and indeed humans, what effect that may have on uh, biodiversity or species diversity now and into the future. What is the human mandate? We know that there is uh, a lot of information that has been uh, shared through from the times of Mendel when we first started to look at patterns of inheritance. Uh, through Darwin and our understanding of natural selection and some of the drivers. And of course, uh, Darwin himself also focused on artificial selection and the fact that the, the processes that he felt were happening in natural situations were also ones that humans could manipulate uh, and cause change in populations uh, that he was studying. But we've come a long way since the discoveries of Mendel and Darwin. And now we know so much, what can we actually do? What do we have a mandate to do? In what ways can we apply our knowledge to help our planet, to improve the quality of human life, to um, create or more efficiently create uh, more and diverse food for a hungry world? Or have we already used our understanding of genetic technologies in ways that we really should not be using them. This is really the focus of this final uh, video in this section is, uh, is what we're doing helping our planet or have we gone too far? Being a science nerd, obviously Jurassic Park's one of my uh, favorite all time movies, the original. Um, I still watch all of the others since then, but the original was fantastic. And one of the key uh, uh, lines from that movie was scientists asking so many questions about whether or not they could that they didn't stop to um, evaluate whether or not they should and obviously delivered by Jeff Goldblum and his character of Ian Malcolm. And that's really the key question that we need to ask ourselves as we look through this final section of biotechnology and think about what's happened in terms of genetic diversity. Now we do know that a lot of the techniques that we've discovered have allowed us to um, move genes from one species to another. And you could argue that's actually increased um, genetic diversity, increased biodiversity, created particular types of individuals that would maybe never have existed um, if natural processes were allowed to, to occur. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a good thing. Our genetic technologies have enabled us to cross species barriers and this influences our understanding of transgenics uh, leading to things like genetically modified organisms and we've talked about these in a little bit of detail in other places and certainly you've had a look at some examples of these uh, during lessons. So the fact that we've crossed some of these species barriers, is that a good thing? Um, or is that potentially something that, again, we don't know the, the impact of because we haven't um, had enough generations to see what effect that's going to have? But of course, one of the other problems that we know we are doing as a result of our understanding is we are um, causing some decreases in genetic diversity, particularly when we look at things like agriculture, uh, we look at population expansion, we know that the world population continues to grow. Uh, it continues to need more space. We can't go out much further. We're going up. 
And at the same time, we're going to need more food to provide for that increase in population. Uh, that's putting a lot of pressure on our farmers and our farming practices in general. And, and processes like agriculture and aquaculture do often reduce species diversity, hopefully not to a monoculture, but sometimes. And that uh, means if there's only a single plant, a single producer that is supporting an entire ecosystem, that is naturally going to reduce the diversity of organisms than if you have a huge range of different producers all at the same trophic level. We talked about the flavour saver tomatoes. We've talked about the fact that there can be tomatoes with specific um, genes added to them um, that may improve a number of aspects of um, taste, quality, shelf life, and maybe even deliver certain types of chemicals um, that may be helpful for humans. Will they um, replace all the current val uh, varieties of tomatoes? Or will they just be one in um, the variety that you can go into the supermarkets or to the greengrocers and get? Um, or will some of these techniques create such uh, an increase in yield, an increase in turnover times that they start to replace all of those others? Are we going to try and engineer more of these plants for um, pest or disease resistance? Are we going to try and um, genetically engineer them so they can be resistant to herbicides or pesticides that we uh, spray around to try and control some of the other organisms that are there? These are all of the questions that we must be thinking about if we're going to um, uh, seriously evaluate this issue of biodiversity. Beyond that, um, as I mentioned, farmers are one of the key groups that are impacted by a lot of these changes, and it's very important that we're aware of that so that, um, we, that the decision-making processes actually include the groups that are most affected. And that's something that doesn't always happen. It's important to remember that there's a lot of people whose livelihoods are tied up in some of the changes that we're making that are associated with genetic technologies. And so therefore it's important that they have some sort of a say in what's happening, um, particularly where it affects their own livelihoods, but also where it's going to have an impact on the diversity of organisms in a particular area. The rainforests are kind of the last bastions and we know that there's been some fantastic discoveries made from the diversity of life in the rainforests. And once we reduce um, that sort of massive diversity in, this, in the oceans is another place where we, get, where we get a lot of diversity. But when we start to reduce that, particularly by looking at our producers, we're significantly um, going to affect our range of different types of organisms that are part of these complex food webs down to much simpler food webs and perhaps we're going to have a big impact on biodiversity as a result. So some of the significant implications that we may be able to talk about when you're doing your evaluation on biodiversity are things like herbicide and pesticide use and whether or not they are going to be resistant genes which may actually encourage um, the use of these particular types of chemicals um, to help control the, the, the pests or the weeds that are growing in particular areas where we don't want them. Um, some unfavorable diversity development is that are we going to make decisions? Okay, about which species to keep, which species to lose. That, that argument we talked about a little bit with mosquitoes in terms of their carrying of a number of different types of diseases, not just the plasmodium that causes malaria. But what happens if we just say, or could we say, mosquitoes, they don't do anything, they're no use to us, let's get rid of them from the planet altogether. And what sort of consequences might that have if we make decisions like that? Our experiences with COVID tell us that pathogens aren't just going to lie down and be wiped out. They're going to continue to evolve. They're going to continue to change, um, to mutate into different strains, different forms, different variants. And as a result of that, they're going to cling very tightly to life and try and maintain their hold. And so that's going to put a pressure back on us. How are we going to respond to that? What sort of things are we going to do? How effective are our vaccines? And do we need to keep uh, developing and changing them? And what's happening to the spread of engineered genes, the genes that are actually already out in the environment and are planning to be released? What's going to happen when they start to mutate, when they start to change, and when we go through multiple generations, what are the consequences 
of some of those. So that brings us to something that I guess is, is something that we need to have a think about. I love these infographics because they give you lots of nice statistics, numbers, pictures, stimulation for your brain to think about what sort of things are actually going on in our world. What's happening to biodiversity? What's happening to the number of species on Earth? How many are we unaware of that we're losing? Um, how many is a good number? How many can we lose before we start to get really worried? These are critical questions and they're part of our study of biology and they're hopefully part of the things that you're uh, thinking about as you go through and look at all of these absolutely wonderful genetic technologies that we've learned how to use, um, but that we also need to keep asking ourselves that question whether or not we should. Thanks for watching.